let me introduce our really great panel. I'm really pleased that they were all able to join us today uh, for the community meeting. Um, so first, we'll actually hear from four people representing the infrastructure side of things, uh, providing services around metadata and persistent identifiers. Uh, we'll first hear from Ginny Hendricks from Crossref. After that, Shaoli Chen from DataSight. Then we'll have Shauna Sattler from ORCID and then Amanda French from Roar. And there will also be th three talks from people representing the funding side of things. First, Aaron McKeeran, uh, representing the Open Research Funders Group, then Kristen Elden Wiley from the Templeton World Charity Foundation, and last but not least, Maria Cruz from uh, NWO, the Dutch Research Council. So yeah, really excited to have them here today. Um, and yeah, with that, I think I'll hand over uh, to Ginny, who will uh, do the first talk. Over to you, Ginny. Thank you so much, Helena, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I tried to attend all of the earlier sessions of the data site annual meeting as well. Um, and it looks like it's going really well. Um, so to kick this one off, um, I will um, uh, mention a little bit about Crossref. Um, we have, uh, we talk about our uh, vision for this whole community as a research nexus. Um, a lot of people talk about the ecosystem or a PID graph. And uh, if you go to the next slide, Helena, um, you'll see a, a depiction of um, what we're imagining. So a lot of this is aspirational um, and a lot of persistent identifiers are there right in the middle. And uh, you'll see entities, contributors, organizations, lots of research uh, outputs, also inputs, um, and all of those things ideally have a persistent and open, unique identifier, and many of them do, um, with some exceptions. Um, and we're really interested in the connections between all of those things. So the little bubbles around the outside kind of depict the relationships and the actions that happen as these objects relate to each other, as these objects or entities interact with each other. Uh, so yeah, we are trying to, with uh, with our sort of sister infrastructure organizations, bring together disparate pieces of the scholarly record to have a really better view of, um, of these kinds of relationships. Um, we are obviously having to look at multi-party assertions, like each organization has their own members, uh, some of them overlap. Um, but there are also users and other players out there that are uh, commenting on, mentioning and looking at research. And wouldn't it be great if we could collect things like um, uh, assertions that uh, something was verified or reproduced or refuted? So this is the direction of travel. Um, and as I said, about 60% of this is already possible and the rest we see is quite aspirational and there's a number of uh, projects underway. Um, so on the next slide, I've got a, a few uh, high level numbers about uh, Crossref. Um, it has grown in 23 years to 19,000 organizations, 152 countries. Um, it's, it's a lot of numbers to throw at you, so I won't linger too long on this. Um, but it's heavily used. Uh, we work really closely with other organizations um, to make sure that they can access the metadata. And uh, yeah, it's really heavily used. Um, we are uh, about 47 staff and we have um, uh, contractors and all sorts of partners and ambassadors around the world. Um, and yeah. The, the the scale of this infrastructure is quite large and in 2024 we'll be spending almost a million US dollars on data storage and processing uh, just in one year. Uh, so just to give you a little flavor of that. Now on to uh, the real topic um, of this session, which is uh, to talk about uh, funders and their role in um, uh, metadata sharing and tracking of research. Uh, so uh, the whole point of um, an identifier is to uh, locate um, and link to other related objects, really, persistently over time. Uh, so Crossref in 2017 developed uh, DOIs for grants, and it's developed into a sort of fuller support system. Uh, and the point is to yeah, track long-term reach and return of, of the funding organization's uh, support for research, look at patterns, anticipate trends, 
um, uh, standardize that metadata openly and make it available to others. And already we have uh, 30 uh, funding organizations with uh, 77 funding programs. So for example, one of those funders is the European um, Commission. And so their funding programs include Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe, Marie Curie uh, projects and things like that. Uh, and the, uh, yes, thank you, Helena. Um, so the whole kind of support system around this is about the identifier. So that's the first step. A grant DOI is very useful, can be shared, can be uh, integrated by other systems. Um, but we always say identifiers are necessary, but not sufficient. So it is about that enriching uh, metadata and relationships uh, around it as well. So Crossref has, you know, an active uh, schema group. Uh, we are, um, uh, you know, our members are identifying not just financial funding, but also other kinds of support for, um, uh, for research. So that could be salary awards or use of facilities and things like that. Uh, we are looking now in our funder uh, advisory group at project level metadata. Uh, we have um, uh, about 200 people invited to that. So mostly funding organizations, but also uh, many people on this on this group, um, Europe PMC and other systems like uh, Proposal Central. Um, and we have a lot of documentation, we've got technical support and um, our R&D team also have been looking at uh, early kind of outcomes of how uh, the grants that are registered with Crossref are also linked to outputs like articles and um, and other, uh, other outputs as well. Uh, and on the next slide, I've got um, what some people call a sticker sneeze, which is a, a, a sheet of logos of all of the organizations that are members of Crossref currently. Uh, and uh, it's great to see funders adding metadata to the research ecosystem. Um, you know, uh, repositories and, and uh, publishers have been doing it for a while with award IDs, but now that there is uh, a system that supports a persistent global identifier for grants, these are the organizations that are kind of like stepped up to first um, make those assertions from their point of view and, and put their perspective from their side of the story into the system. Uh, I will skip over the next slide because I'm conscious of time and go straight to the what's next. <laughs> uh, we're adding additional funding types. Uh, we're looking at exposing free text statements from funding acknowledgements. Uh, that's stuff that, you know, text miners want. Um, and uh, some, it's really messy to, to extract funding acknowledgements from papers, for example. So a lot of uh, downstream users are asking us just for the free text so they can pass them themselves. Um, we are looking at hosting landing pages for grants. We have a prototype for that. Uh, a, a surprising number of funders don't have information about their grants on their website. Um, and even if they do, it might not have a unique URL. So we are going to host um, information about the grants uh, for some of them while they get that, that, that online. Um, we're looking at project level metadata, which is already included in grant records, but um, might need identifiers. And um, I'm sure that will come up in the questions as well. And yeah, we one big piece of it is we need others to pick up these grant DOIs. Um, so they need to be picked up in publication, manuscript tracking workflows and things like that. Uh, and then looking far, far, far into the future, um, there's some early uh, discussions about, do we also want to identify and track grant proposals? So even further upstream in the, in the process and even grant reviews as well. And uh, hopefully I've given a little flavor of what Crossref's role is here and the funders that we're working with. And I will uh, leave it there and say thank you very much. I'm looking forward yeah. to the discussion. Thank you, Ginny. If you have questions for Ginny, please put them in the Q&A so she can answer those later. And then I think we'll move to Shaoli. So Shaoli, thanks, please Anna. go ahead. Yeah, and also thanks, Ginny, for the fantastic overview on uh, Crossref's work for the funders community. And hello, everyone. It's glorious that we have so many participants right now. Uh, and uh, I, I'm Zali, I'm the lead of the Implementing Fair Workflows project here at Delicide. Um, and through the project, 
and beyond, uh, Delta has been dedicating a lot of work towards building a set of general guidance for various stakeholder groups to engage in the adoption of person identifiers and relevant workflows to enable fair research. Particularly relevant for the funders is the reliable tracing of research outputs and impact. So I will very briefly walk through data size perspectives on this. The next slide, please. Uh, so as we know, uh, the tracking of outputs start from uniquely and persistently identifying the outputs. So the open metadata generated is through the PID reg registration will map the contour of these research activities and increase transparency to the wider scholarly community. So the data side infrastructure enables the identification, description, and connection of research uh, resources, different types of them, including research funding, and engages the global community in the development of best practices for data sharing and lend trust to the data, metadata records. The, um, most importantly, it empowers the various stakeholders, including funding organizations, to take advantage of the open discovery portal and APIs to gather insights and reporting on the impact of the research outputs. Uh, next slide, please. So when successfully implemented, that is a metadata allows the tracking of different types of research outputs and their relationships. For example, a data set and the software that generated it, a preprint and resulting formal, a formal publication, a report, and the data set that it is based on this type of relation. And on a higher level, thanks to the built-in interoperability in the data set meta schema, outputs can also be tracked across related research producers and enablers, such as researchers identified with ORCID IDs, research organizations identified with RUR IDs, and research funders identified with RUR or uh, cross-reference funder IDs. And this enables us to answer questions like, sorry, I was still on the first slide. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, so I was saying that, that that will enable us to answer some questions like who created a data set and what other output this person had produced and which funding were they awarded with and which funding organization offered that grant. So this all connected can be queried. And next slide, please. So provide an overview of the various PIDs offered and relevant imp implementations to funding organizations through the Fair Workflow Project, DataSci, Crossref, and ORCID co-authored this piece of general guide uh, to, uh, to help funders support uh, uh, fair workflows and enable research tracking. And this document is right now publicly available on Zenodo and it's open for comments from the wider community since September. Uh, the, uh, the document opens with an introduction to, uh, to open research and open scholarly infrastructure and their relevance to the risk funding organizations, part particularly the unique vantage point the funders uh, have that allows them, to uh, allows them to take initiatives and generate great impact. And then it goes on to lay out the three main areas of work funders should focus on, the knowing and maintaining funder identifiers, creating and managed grant identifiers, and providing guidance for researchers as well as other stakeholders. So following that, we have a big table uh, outlining the specific actions funders can take across the research project lifecycle, directly and indirectly. So for example, funders can directly implement a grant ID creation workflow as a point of grant award and put in place subsequent maintenance and monitoring workflows. At the same time, they can also make explicit, explicit request for researchers to include the grant ID string when acknowledging the funder and grant in their outputs or in, embedded in the metadata when it's possible, thus fostering fair practice and indirectly contribute to the enrichment of the open connection metadata overall. Next slide, please. Um, at the background of all this is the Implementing Fair Workflow project, where we link all these initiatives together, examine the entire research project lifecycle, and identify stages and specific points in the research process where researchers, funders, and platform providers, uh, service providers can leverage the existing global 
open scholarly infrastructure to make research fair. The project is funded by TWCF and our wonderful uh, grant manager who is also on this panel today uh, created a Crossref grant ID for the project, which we've been actively using when sharing outputs throughout the project period. And through the project, we, we often hear from the researchers uh, and they constant, that they constantly look to their funders for guidance regarding data sharing and output reporting specifics, as well as service integrators that cater to the funding organization community rely on inputs from the funders to put relevant PID related integrations on the pro uh, product roadmap slash priority list. So it's important that funders make their use cases heard and the request explicit, and that's where the magic is starting to happen. And next slide, please. Uh, finally, I have two questions for my fellow panelists uh, uh, for, uh, for the discussion following this presentation. Um, so it's just, just keep it in the back of your mind a little bit for the funders. Uh, as the, the funders we have on, uh, on the panels today are all quite established in their efforts around the introducing fair practices into funding workflows. So what advice do you have uh, for other funding organizations that are considering to build effective PIDs and metadata into their process? And for our sister infrastructure organizations, my question is, uh, in your opinion, where can funders have the most impact in terms of raising the adoption rate of PIDs and metadata? So yeah, that's uh, end of my talk. Thanks very much and looking forward to the discussion. Okay, thanks a lot, Charlie. And I think with that, um, we move to Shauna from ORCID. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. I am Shauna Sadler, and I am ORCID's Engagement Manager for Outreach and Partnerships. Next slide, please. So ORCID provides a persistent identifier for people. And so our sister organizations provide persistent identifiers for research objects and research outputs of various kinds, and of course, for grants. Uh, ORCID, we just focus on the people. Uh, so with what we do is we offer three specific services. Um, so first is that ORCID registers uh, people for an ORCID ID, or rather I should say researchers register themselves for an ORCID ID free of charge. Uh, so here is an example of an ORCID ID you'll see in the top left corner for our fictional researcher, Sophia. Um, her ORCID ID ends in 2427. So it's a 16 digit identifier and you can see it there. The second service we offer is providing an ORCID record. And so that's what this screenshot is, is an example of Sophia's fictional ORCID record. And this is where researchers collect all of their research activities. So it's their profile as a professional researcher. We don't collect personal information. It's strictly professional. And then third service offering is on the next slide. ORCID provides APIs to exchange the data with other systems in the research ecosystem with the intent to reduce the administrative burden on researchers, but also on administrative staff at, say, funding agencies. So ORCID works with funders usually in two ways. So first, people applying for funding um, where the data is in their ORCID record, that data in the ORCID record can pre-populate the funders' forms, um, which again helps to reduce the administrative burden on researchers, but when the data is taken from the ORCID record, it also helps improve the quality of the data uh, that be that is submitted to the funder in their forms. Um, second, at the time of award, uh, funders can write data about the award to the person's ORCID record. Uh, the data will then be reused. As I mentioned before, the data can be reused from their ORCID record to fill out other forms like the researcher's annual report. So the second way ORCID works with funders is with peer reviewers. So funders can review ORCID records to identify potential peer reviewers. Um, when the person completes their peer review service, the funder can write the service to their ORCID record as vaguely or specifically as the funder likes. Um, just a quick note, the person who owns the ORCID record is always in full control of the data on that record, so they can either delete or limit the visibility of the peer review that you added to their record, and they can do this at any time they like. Next slide, please. So like my sister organizations, we have a workflow as well. Uh, we have them at different Zooms. So ours is a little bit more focused 
on the funders workflow. Um, so this is what, you know, ORCID from our perspective thinks about what a funders workflow would be for, you know, using our different identifiers. Uh, so in the top left corner, it looks black in this uh, slide, it's blue in my slide. Um, the funder collects the ORCID ID from the researcher, usually at the time of application. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, can pre-populate the application form with data in the ORCID record. So then in the top right, the gray section, uh, the funder writes awards to ORCID records and recognizes the peer review service in the ORCID records as well. And then moving down um, to the blue, to the blue uh, is about dissemination. And so ORCID's role is to facilitate trust and transparency about the person who uh, receive the funding. Uh, and then as it relates to my uh, colleague organizations, Data Site and Crossref, who conducted the research? You know, who are these people who received the funding? Who, uh, who did this research? And so the ORCID record can provide their professional record. Uh, so the readers can understand um, more about this person. And so last in that orange section, uh, funders can use all of our PIDs to analyze the impact of your funding as both Ginny and Zali mentioned. Um, so I think what's also really important is um, funders can use this data to analyze and create really interesting reports for your stakeholders. So with your funding, who received your funding, what scholarly outputs came from your funding, uh, and you know, hopefully in the future, uh, what facilities, research facilities and instruments were used as well. Um, these are all great stories that funders can tell about the impact of their funding. And using PIDs to do this work is really effective and really exciting, to be honest. Uh, and then last slide. So ORCID, we host a funder community. We have about 40 funders from around the world who participate in this community. Um, Ginny did a sticker sneeze, so I'll just do a list um, for our group. This is just a sample of, of the 40, so you can see. Um, but we are accepting new members. So if your funder organization is interested in joining ORCID's funder community, we meet once every two months, and we try to uh, make sure that the topics of conversation are most interesting to the group. And that's the end of my talk, and I look forward to your questions at the end. Yeah, thanks a lot, Shauna. And um, obviously, if you have questions for Shauna, please also add these into Q&A so we can get to those later. And then, uh, yeah, Amanda's next. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. My name is Amanda French. I am the Technical Community Manager for ROAR, the Research Organization Registry. Next slide, please. So ROAR is a global community-led registry of open persistent identifiers for research organizations. Um, as Shauna has just eloquently explained, and as you're probably already aware, ORCID is an identifier for people. And ROAR is, in some ways, very similar to that, except that it is an identifier for organizations. We are established, open, trusted, sustainable, and free. Uh, we're financially supported and governed by Datasight and Crossref and the California Digital Library, all of whom think that ROAR is an important part of the scholarly ecosystem. And all our data is public domain and free to download and reuse. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about some of the services we provide. Um, so services that we specifically provide to funders include responsive curation. Meaning that if, for instance, we have anyone with the Max Planck Society here and you're looking at this record and saying, well, actually, there's something that we'd like added or something that we'd like changed, um, we can absolutely work with you to do that for free. We have a very responsive and open curation process so that you can simply contact us and say we'd like to add more sub-organizations to the Max Planck Society, we'd like to um, add some acronyms, some other names, anything like that. For a single record, our current turnaround time is usually within a month or sooner for single requests. And we're increasingly accepting larger bulk curation requests and working with funders to do that. Um, recently, we've been working with a lot of fairly large US federal funders, including NASA and NOAA, um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency to uh, help capture all of their sub agencies and their laboratories, their facilities, um, all of that can be included in the raw record. 
Um, for software developers, we have a REST API and a free data set and an affiliation matching service that can help match text strings to ROAR IDs. Uh, we work to promote the use of ROAR in publishers, systems, repository systems, and indexing systems. Uh, the more systems that use this kind of connection metadata or persistent identifiers, the better the data becomes throughout the entire ecosystem. Next slide. So I wanted to concentrate on some of the ways that ROAR is already being used um, in by funders or funder adjacent um, purposes. So I did a case study a few months ago uh, with the manager of a data repository at Caltech. And uh, he said, as you can see on this slide, that ROAR is going to make reporting to funders much easier for them. Um, and that's because they're trying to track, you know, their researchers publications from all kinds of systems and specifically in this slide, you can see that he's saying that um, we're trying to track who is collaborating with whom roar has geographic data, as you may have noticed so. Um, institutions are increasingly very pleased that they can use roar to make sure that all of this data is clean and complete and accurate and that they can track relationships um, between those institutions, including, say, which ones are in which countries. Um, so this is one key use that we're already seeing of ROAR. We just want to promote the spread of that. Next slide. Here's another tool that is using ROAR. Um, if you could click, please, and we have a little animation. <laughs> uh, so this is a tool called OA Report, uh, which has an open and free tier, um, which is, in fact, architected on ROAR, as you can see, uh, for institutions, and it enables um, specifically um, sort of OA compliance, OA policy compliance, how many of um, the research outputs that a particular organization has funded are open access, free to read, have data availability statements, and this is uh, this kind of system, uh, including this particular system, is very reliant on ROAR to disambiguate these institutions, uh, these funders and make sure that all this data is clean, complete, disambiguated. Next slide. Here's another example. This is actually at the national level. Um, this is a, a, a German OA monitor um, that, uh, again, as you can see, is kind of reliant on war in its architecture to, in this case, check the open access status of um, publications at particular universities mainly and research facilities uh, within Germany. Um, so it's a it's a fantastic tool. It's um, doing a lot of great work that uh, funders can use, but then also institutions use uh, can use to track this kind of thing. Next slide. Um, this is a GIF, which is uh, here, here's the beginning of it. Um, one of the major streams of work that Roar is engaged in right now is something that was on Ginny's slides earlier. Um, and this is really um, work that we are doing in conjunction with Crossref. Some of you may know that Crossref has been running in conjunction with Elsevier, a really wonderful service called the Open Funder Registry um, for I think about a decade. And that is a registry of about 35,000 organizations currently, um, which are creating identifiers for funders. And this is already used uh, quite widely throughout the publishing system. Um, However, the same funders that are in the open regist funder registry are also often in ROAR. Um, and in fact, we've just published a blog post today on the ROAR blog about how often that is. So Crossref and ROAR are working together to merge these two registries so that um, it will simplify your use of PIDs so that anyone who wants to use an identifier to uh, cleanly and consistently identify a funder will be able to eventually use ROAR for that in addition to using ROAR for things like investigator affiliations. So if an investigator is affiliated with the Max Planck Society, you can use ROAR for that. If the Max Planck Society is issuing funding uh, or some agency is issuing um, funding, you can also use a ROAR ID for that instead of having to set up your systems to uh, maintain two separate registries. Next slide. That is about all I have. Uh, except that I would like to know from funders um, what effect, if any, will this uh, currently ongoing merger of the Open Funder Registry and ROAR have on you? Great question. Thanks, Amanda. 
Okay, so you now, you've now heard from uh, the four people that are representing infrastructure services, and now we'll move to the three people that are representing funding organizations. So we'll first go to Erin from the Open Research Funders Group. Thanks, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, really glad to be here. So um, my name is Erin McKiernan and I am the Community Manager for the Open Research Funders Group. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of us before, um, this is our membership. So we are uh, a group of 26 private funders, philanthropies, um, that share this common belief that sharing research, sharing uh, scholarship is really the right way to go. Uh, and not just for uh, society, for research, but um, in general, just as an enabling strategy to help these various organizations um, meet their missions. Uh, and so you can see that our, our membership is, is pretty diverse here. So we have um, primarily funding organizations in the US, but we also have two members based in the Bahamas, one in the UK, um, definitely open to more international uh, uh, membership. And we also have big, large funders, um, and we have funders that are funding really across the disciplinary spectrum. So um, we have several biomedical funders, but also uh, funders in the physical sciences um, and those really funding across a broad range of um, social initiatives, uh, arts and the humanities. Um, and I think it's important uh, to mention again that um, we have kind of this big tent philosophy. Uh, so we're not trying to unite funders under a common policy. Um, but rather really trying to meet funders where they are, um, figure out what is the best strategy for them um, and how we can help them develop policies, develop strategies um, that'll support open scholarship in ways that, that really make sense for them. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, in terms of where our funders are at on PIDs and metadata, um, I think we're seeing better, various kind of approaches, heterogeneous approaches to PIDs and metadata metadata across our membership, and I think more generally across funders as well. Um, the most common practices that we're hearing about right now are that our funders are collecting or even requiring in some cases that um, grant uh, applicants um, enter their systems or, or include an ORCID ID. Um, and the second one that we're hearing more and more is that funders are starting to register their grants um, with DOIs. Uh, but I'll say that overall, I think the uptake is still very low, um, and it's something that we'd like to, to see, uh, and we'd like to help increase adoption. And um, in terms of the, the questions that funders have, I think there are a lot of open questions for them in terms are of what are the best practices uh, in terms of PIDs and metadata, which PIDs uh, should funders be collecting and why, and what in particular might this enable them to do? And I think the big question there for them is, how would collecting this information or also feeding back into the system um, help funders with things like uh, policy compliance checking and output tracking? Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about a community effort that we've uh, launched. Um, and, and really, again, with this idea that we would like to uh, both act as the funder voice uh, in this space, but um, hopefully also contribute to improving research output tracking. So in June of 2022, um, we published an open letter that was inspired by an internal working group. Uh, we had uh, funders that were getting together and discussing these issues. Um, and when we put out that open letter, we also issued a call for community feedback. Um, so we uh, opened up a survey to hear from, from folks in this space about what they thought were kind of the, the big gaps, the most urgent issues. Um, and we reported on those results in September of 2022. And I'll say that kind of across the board, um, that survey, survey identified PIDs and metadata as uh, priority areas for action. Uh, so following that, we launched um, open community calls and really have been um, impressed with the cross-sector participation. We have researchers and institutions, we have uh, you know, nonprofit, for-profit publishers, we have public and private funders, so really a great representation across the board. Um, we've launched four different uh, PID and metadata work streams based on the input and the discussions that we received through those community calls. Those launched in April of this year, and I'll talk a little bit about those in a moment. Um, and importantly, we have uh, several community co-leads, so we want to make sure that this is work um, driven and informed by the community. 
Um, and I can include some links in the chat, but we recently in June, we reported back on uh, those work streams and their progress to date. And we're hoping that we'll have the first public drafts of some deliverables um, by the end of this year. Next slide, please. Um, so I wanna say that again, cross-sector collaboration uh, here for us has been really key. Um, and I'm putting up the, the organizations that we have helping us co-lead these efforts. Um, but I do wanna mention that other folks on the call, ORCID, ROAR and NWO are all involved in this research output tracking uh, community effort. Um, so it's important for us obviously to have funder participation, Templeton World Charity, more and the larger kind of ORFG. Um, infrastructure, of course, Crossref and data site, um, and also um, participants like NISO that are working on standards. And then finally, institutional participation. And particularly here, I wanna call out uh, Helios. This is the Higher Education Leadership Initiative for Open Scholarship. So 97 institutions across the US. And we wanna make sure we're continuing to talk to them as well, so that anything we come up with um, makes sense kind of across the board and we're, we're integrating uh, solutions. Next slide, please. Um, so just to talk uh, briefly about those community work streams. So we have four. Um, one on DOIs for grants that is being co-led by um, Moore Foundation and Crossref. We're currently working on an FAQ for funders, so that would be kind of a value proposition of why funders might want to do this. Um, we're working closely with uh, Datasite and TWCF on the enabling FAIR workflows, um, particularly outlining some actors and actions that um, could be taken at different stages of the research lifecycle to embed PIDs and metadata. And then working on two, uh, two projects that have to do directly with PIDs. One is a toolkit um, that might work for funders and institutions to know what are the principal PIDs and how might they use them. And then finally, a national strategy. So we are seeing federal agency movement on this. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we're helping as a community inform um, federal efforts on how PIDs and metadata will be used. Um, so we will report back soon on, on those funding streams. Um, and hope to have a lot more, a lot more news for folks. Um, I think that might be my last slide. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks so much. It was. Thanks a lot, Erin. Okay, then I think we have Kristen next. Hi. Um, Orsi and Erin have been a big supporter of the last few years as we navigate this uh, space and a big re reason why we do what we're doing with PIDs. Uh, so just a shout out to you too, Erin. Uh, Templeton World Charity Foundation. Oh, next slide, please. Uh, Templeton World Charity Foundation uh, was established in 1996 by Sir John Templeton in Nassau, Bahamas, to serve as a global philanthropic philanthrop a catalyst and um, for discoveries relating to big questions of life and the universe in the areas of science, theology, philosophy, and human society. Yeah, it's kind of very broad, um, but maybe our current initiatives can put a little bit of color on this, and I'll give you an example of just one. Uh, it's listening and learning in a polarized world. Um, we support research projects to help us better understand the problem of polarization and possibly, hopefully, discover solutions. Currently, we fund over 200 projects in 40 countries with support of over $30 million over the last five years. Uh, next slide, please. The world of PIDs and open metadata is important to the foundation because we see it as a solution to quite a few challenges that we're facing as a funder, but more broadly as a key for a robust research community. So I'm just gonna go through a few of those challenges. Um, so what is a big question that the trustees and the board of directors ask foundation staff or what do foundation staff ask themselves? This question is, what is the impact that we have in the world? How are we doing? And we currently have no easy way to track the impact of our funding. We can send up, set up monitoring, learning and evaluation programs by hodgepodging five or six systems to, or service providers and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to get closer to this. But to be clear, I don't think the capability to track outputs would mean that we're golden with MLE, but I think it is an important critical step. Um, second is we're wasting, we're wasting a lot of time. Our application process and our desire to evaluate a potential applicant are heavily reliant on that applicant putting in information. Uh, how many times are they doing this every year for different funding opportunities or across the year for different funding opportunities? Um, again, in the active grant stage, we're relying on grantees to report and outputs, to share the deliverables, to provide the accurate DOIs. 
And then again, we only have access during the active grant period. This door shuts when the grant closes. Um, another challenge um, in this area is that we're heavily reliant on other actors in the research environment to do their part in achieving a fair workflow. Um, and we're not, it's not just us that's heavily reliant, everyone's heavily reliant on all the other actors. A funder can require a grantee to use various PIDs when posting an output online, but this requirement is only as good as that infrastructure having that field when they go to do it. Now the grantee UI isn't a required field by the publisher or by the repository, and our effort of assigning grantee UIs doesn't have the full impact that we're hoping for. This goes in all ways, of course, and all actors in the space are highly dependent on the actions of other actors for this fair workflow model to work. Finally, the research we fund is not reaching its full potential. Without the proper and full use of PIDs and metadata, the research is not findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Next slide, please. Uh, like a lot of us here, I think that PIDs are an essential key to solving these challenges. It will mean the research has more impact and also has more potential, partly because researchers and funding staff aren't wasting as much time providing and asking the same information over and over again. Um, and we'll be able to, we'll be able to monitor, we'll be better able to monitor, evaluate, and learn as funders. This is why we spend a lot of time as foundation staff and fair workflow and PID working groups, and why we have integrated them somewhat into our workflows. Um, one way is we've been creating grant DOIs for just over a year. Um, we require our grantees to use this when they're acknowledging us as funders and any of their work. We're also trying to normalize the use of it making it very visible in our grant management system, including it in the project summary pages on the website and um, using it as the identifier when we're communicating inwardly and outwardly about our projects. Ideally, what I want is that Greek grant DOIs will become the connector that we need so we don't need to ask grantees to report on outputs on our grant management system. We'll know already because they use that grant DOI in the funder acknowledgement field and it is automatically pushed to our output tracking system. We require the ORCID ID for project directors and co-directors currently, but it's just an open text box field and anything can be added to it. I would like it to be a required field for all researchers on the grant. And I also want it to replace the requirement for the CV and to be the single sign-on used in our grant management system. I want the grants to be pushed into the researcher's ORCID page once they're granted and peer reviewed activities to be pushed to the external reviewers page once they review a proposal. I think we'll get there soon, but we're heavily reliant on our grant management system service provider. Uh, we ask for persistent identifiers for any of the outputs our grantees are reporting on, but I see a future where we won't have to ask. Again, grantee-wise. We do very little with ROAR. Um, I only add it to our metadata for the cross-ref um, grantee OI, um, but I see it act in the future where it can act as a unique identifier in our grant management system, which would mean that everything is, there's less need to kind of manage in the duplicates that it has. Um, in closing, there is a lot more that we can do, uh, but this is an area of open research that I have prioritized amongst all other activities, um, because I think building the right infrastructure is critical to the success of, of sharing. Thanks. Thanks, Kristen. Really great to uh, to hear what you're working towards. And then we'll go to the final presentation by Maria. Hi, hello, everyone. I'm Maria Cruz. I work at NVO, the Dutch Research Council, and I'll talk about how we are enabling fair workflows. Uh, I, I just want to say a few words about NVO. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, for those, because it's a inter very international audience. So the Dutch Research Council is the main research funder in the Netherlands. We fund research at public research institutions and we fund research uh, in, in all fields and disciplines. We invest also in large scale research facilities and we manage our own research institutes. And just to give an idea of size, I included some key figures from our uh, annual report from 2022. So we, we spent, uh, well, last year we uh, spent 1.2 billion euros in funding uh, for research and research infrastructure, which includes uh, funding uh, research staff FTEs at various research 
uh, institutes in the Netherlands, uh, close to 5,000 uh, staff uh, FTEs. Uh, we received about uh, close to 6,000 funding applications uh, award, about 1,500. And, and, and because uh, an award will be for a project that will be for more than a year, on any given year, we are managing about 7,000 uh, research projects. So this gives you an idea if we register grant IDs, how many awards we, how many uh, IDs we'd be register, registering in, in one year. So just to give you an idea of uh, size and what we do. Next slide, please. So I'm I'm going to talk about three main uh three main ways three main ways uh and through which we facilitate uh fair workflows it's through our grant requirements and guidance for researchers through incentives and rewards from researchers and finally by adopting PITS uh, persistent identifiers in our own funder workflows next slide please so in terms of our grant requirements, um, the lab, we have a, we are a Plan S compliant. We have an open access a policy uh, with uh, where we request immediate open access upon publication. And of course, Plan S has uh, requirements for uh, persistent identifiers as well in metadata. And then for research data management, we require uh, data uh, that uh, is produced as part of our uh, the projects we fund that this data is as fair as possible and of course that's uh, one of the fair first principles uh the first uh fair principles is that uh data should be uh, assigned the persistent and global um identifier uh, we require a data management plan for every funded project and, and we provide our own guidance but more importantly we require researchers to consult with data stewards in preparing their data management plans. And here is where researchers will get, get uh, expert guidance on depositing their data sets, uh, metadata for the data sets, uh, PITs. Uh, so this is one way uh, we try to ensure that research outputs that, are, that we fund um, are made findable uh, through metadata and persistent identifiers. And um, as with Plan S for research, research data management, we follow uh, the Science Europe uh, core requirements for research data management to ensure that we align our requirements with uh, other organizations in Europe and, and worldwide. And we also provide guidance uh, for research software management that includes guidance uh, on software citation. So again, uh, adding metadata and registering uh, software with persistent identifiers. So that this is one of the ways that we uh, ensure uh, fair workflows through grant requirements and guidance. The other way, uh, next slide, is through our Open Science Fund. And in the Netherlands, Netherlands, when we say open science, we mean open research or open scholarship. Science here means uh, all fields and disciplines. Uh, we have a, a fund that uh, to support projects specifically designed to implement and stimulate open science practices, and this includes fair workflows. And we have funded um, uh, quite a number of projects focusing on uh, metadata standards uh, for interoperability. And uh, Ginny mentioned uh, registering grant proposals in, in the future. In, in this uh, in this program, we uh, share the research proposals, both awarded and non-awarded, where we have consent from the applicants. And I have to say, we are not sharing it in a, in a fair way. We can improve that, um, but perhaps there will be a future. Um, and, and we share also where we have uh, consent, the reviewer, um, the reviewer reports. So perhaps in, in in, in future, Ginny, we might be registering uh, PITs for proposals as well. Uh, it, it's still an aspiration, <laughs> not a reality yet. And, and finally, uh, the next slide, please, is our persistent identifier strategy. Um, 
we published it in April 2021. Uh, it has its own PID, of course, through Zenodo, so through data sites. Um, and we wanted to have a cohesive uh, strategy uh, on persistent identifiers. We worked with uh, colleagues at SURF, our um, national center for uh, IT for research and education. And we uh, published a strategy that um, the main recommendation was to integrate uh, three persistent identifiers into grant workflows, workflows like uh, ORCID, Grant ID, uh, and ROAR. Uh, and we've heard, of course, from all of these infrastructure providers. I didn't have uh, space to put everything on the slide, but another, uh, the, the previous speakers talked about cross-sector collaboration. And I, I think it's really important. Um, and, and so that was also one of the, the, the recommendations to work together with other funders and with uh, the um, service providers to, to influence this uh, PID ecosystem. The first step in, in implementing our strategy is to register grant metadata with Crossref. We, we are, we are in, well, just became members of Crossref. We're just in the process of becoming members of Crossref. Um, it took quite a while uh, to assemble a project team to, um, even though we have a strategy that was approved by our board, we had to, there's a lot of people that need to be involved in implementing um, grant, ID, grant ID because there are implications uh, for our grant process. We finally have a project team that uh, will start. Um, our kickoff meeting is next week, and I'm hoping our first grant registrations maybe late this year, maybe in early 2024. And actually, in, in our strategy, the, the order should have been ORCID and then Grant ID and ROAR in terms of implementation. But one of the difficulties we face is uh, with our grant management system which is not um, prepared to uh, integrate ORCID. So we haven't integrated ORCID yet. It's something we will do in the future when uh, we replace our grant management system. So that I think illustrates some of the difficulties that Erin was mentioning before, that it can be slow. And, I'm, and for us, it's, we are quite aware that we may not immediately benefit uh, from some from a, a registered grant ID in terms of output tracking. We, we, we have the same issues as uh, Templeton. But for us, it's also about leading by example to build a critical mass. If, if the more uh, funders register grant IDs, the more relevant grant ID or, or grant DOIs will become, and that I hope will push other actors in the system to include them in, in their processes. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Then I'll stop sharing my screen because these were the talks for this session. And I really want to thank all the speakers. I think this was a really great overview of this landscape, many different perspectives, many different activities. So it was really good to, to see this and a great starting point for further discussion. Um, let me first take a look at the Q&A. Oh, I see there's a lot already. Um, and I see that... Um, some questions have been answered as well, which complicates things even more. So let me just dive in with a question and then I can do some reading. Um, so here's a question. We're talking about ORCIDs to help reduce administrative burden. However, some profiles are private. Um, how does it reduce administrative burden when you can't pull the information from the profile? Yes, that is a great question. And I think at this point in time, uh, I think it's about awareness and knowledge. So um, so if you're a funder and you'd like to pull data from an ORCID record, uh, it's, it's probably a good idea to let the researcher know that the data in their ORCID record, there's three settings. Uh, it's either fully public, trusted parties, or fully private. And so for the first two, fully public or trusted, the data can be pulled. And so if the funder can notify the researchers of that, uh, then hopefully the researchers will make the data they want shared with the funder uh, available that way. 
thanks. Um, I see another good question here, which I know has already been answered, but just so everyone is aware, uh, what is the preferred relationship between a grant ID and a data management plan DOI? And I know Charlie and Ginny, you both commented, so I don't know who of you wants to comment live. Uh, sorry. Yeah, so um, I give a a short answer to that and uh, uh the short answer is uh in the in the dmp id the doi if it's registered with uh with desite uh has part is a good um good what sorry in the in the grant id if that's a desite doi and it should be a related identifier with has part relation type and um and but there is a long answer to that that will be depending on the specific use case uh, from your institute's perspective. Um, sometimes uh, uh, this, this information are collected for different reasons and uh, we, we hear from the community all the time, uh, new use cases that answer, uh, different relation type uh, terms answer to those use case. So, it's always good to have a have a discussion about that, but in general terms, I think has part is a good option for that. Thanks, Ginny. Anything you want to add? Uh, only just that you know relationships should be two way. Uh, <laughs> so that's great if the data management plan record has some link to the the cross rep grant record, but. Uh, we don't yet have a good way of um, returning that relationship and a link, but uh, I will take it back. So if 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 data site is recommended has part, maybe we need to introduce something like is part or the same thing. So we'll take that back. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, maybe something other people were thinking as well. I see a question here as a grant holder. I had no idea that one could or should assign a DOI. Is this an action the funder or the grant holder has to take? I think that's a great question. I know, Ginny, you already answered it, but maybe you want to comment on it here as well. Uh, well, it's pretty, yeah. I mean, the way it's set up at the moment is it's the funding organization. They are the asserter. We've definitely awarded this project with some funding or some support. Um, so they should be the body kind of making those, uh, stewarding that and making sure that it's kind of, you know, authoritative information. Um, I know, uh, sorry to call on you, but we had this slight discussion, Maria, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I, one thing you were saying was from the funder perspective is like, we can only assert what we as the funder know about and do. And um, I thought, I don't know if that's a useful comment to add here as well about who should be registering the grant uh, DOIs. not the researchers, basically. <laughs> Maria, do you want to add to that? Or I see Aaron's hand up. Aaron, you can also go first if you want to. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to add a quick thing. So so definitely uh, the, the funder needs to register those grants. But um, if the grantee doesn't then use that uh, information, um, it'll drop out of the system, right, in various ways, or it could. Um, so one thing we've been trying to do is collect sample language from funders about how they communicate to their grantees that they've registered the grants with DOIs and then how to use that grant DOI when they share out different outputs. So um, I can share that link with folks, but that language will be available so that other funders could then adopt it and make sure that their grantees then know how to use that identifier. And thank you, Erin. Uh, I'm sure well, we are for sure going to use that um, on our guidance for, for, for researchers. That's one of the things we need to work out. Indeed, you um, assign a, well, you, you tell researchers, here is your, here is your grant DOI, but then you need to also communicate uh, the best way to use it. And in relation to what Ginny just said, I think in that discussion, the context was more, and, 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 and it goes back to what I said about giving the example as NVO, we are doing this not well, partly for our own benefit, but because we feel it's our responsibility. I think, uh, I think, Ginny, you, you mentioned this in your talk as well. Uh, yeah, that is our responsibility to contribute with metadata to the ecosystem. And this is the data that is the data we are the authority on, right? Is this is our data. Yeah, it might also be, yeah, if it comes, um, 
as a source that it says, you know, I, I, I was funded by this organization and it comes, you know, it, this the source of this data and VO, it might give it more um, credibility, but that's more debatable, um, right? So, so it's two things. It's, it's, it's yeah, our responsibility as a funder to contribute to the research information ecosystem and also to give um, uh, an authoritative um, source of data on, on grants. Thanks. I have another question here. Is there a group working to standardize uh, embedding DOIs, authorship, acknowledging funding, etc., within a file metadata to give a more concrete example, embedding this information within a PDF files metadata? I'm not actually entirely sure what's meant, but I don't know if any of the panelists have thoughts on this. Okay. If no thoughts, then um, please, uh, person who asked, feel free to clarify further in the chat or Q&A so we can think more about it. Um, let's see. Ah, there's also a question, and I don't know if someone here knows, but are NIH and NSF also adopting persistent identifiers for grants? Not as far as I know, no. Okay. Uh, at least with yeah, with Crossref, they I think they're more the US ones are with uh, ORFG, right, Erin? Um, well, so we we would just be private funders, so we're in communication with NIH and and NSF, but um, they're not part of our our membership. But I was just going to mention, um, I don't know. If that's that's the quick answer. Um, but I will say as part of last year's OSTP memo, there is a section on research integrity that talks specifically about PIDs and metadata. And federal agencies are going to need to develop specific plans. Those plans, I believe, need to be released in 2026 and will go into effect in 2027. Um, so they have a little bit more time for, to develop those plans than the public access plans, which are already being released. Um, but I think we're definitely going to see a lot more movement on PIDs and metadata because of that um, from the federal agencies. And hopefully um, maybe one part of that is registering grants with DOIs. And Helena, just quickly. So with NIH and NSF, uh, they've been you know, part of ORCID since our inception as part, particularly the NIH. Uh, the NSF is uh, driving what's called the common form so that new, those forms that will hopefully be adopted across the US agencies that fund research. And in that common form, there's two forms. And uh, the ORCID ID is requested or encouraged in the first one for the biosketch, which is a CV. Uh, and then we do map data from an ORCID record to populate that form. Uh, so again, to reduce the administrative burden. Uh, and then hopefully uh, there is, we've understood the intent to map. Uh, ORCID data to the second form, the current pending other support form. It's a mouthful, but uh, it, that's like the updating. You know, this is the new uh, funding that I've received or new in-kind contributions. Uh, and so ORCID data can hopefully will pre-populate that. In the, we're expecting the next couple of months, but of course it's a bit of a complicated time with the US government and shutdowns and if people will be paid. So we're not sure when things might go live, but you know, we certainly wish them all the best. And, and there certainly has been positive intent and it's been a real pleasure working with that team. I think there's a related question as well. Oh, I think it's now appearing. Um, I know NIH and NSF read ORCID records, but do they write information to researchers ORCID records once a grant has been awarded? Um, not yet, and I'm hoping it's the word yet. Uh, I, they certainly understand that that is capable. Um, nothing has been promised yet, uh, but I think the the you know research security and public access to data is really having a big impact on their workflows and their systems. And so it's it's a lot that has to be done. It's no small thing in the U.S. So um, they understand. Uh, I have full confidence that they fully get it. Uh, it's about implementation and that's that's going to be a lot and that's a big thing. So hopefully, but we'll have to all be patient on that one. Thanks. Um, so a new one just came in. We operate as a center within a university framework, but are subject to specific reporting requirements imposed by our foundation-based funder. 
and it's not a member of the Open Research Funders Group. Could any panelists elaborate on services or support that could help us streamline our reporting process to meet these unique obligations? Interesting one. Is someone able to comment where they could start? Sorry, I missed the institution. What was the institution? I don't think that was mentioned. Oh, okay. Um, I was just going to say, so um, I'm not sure this will be the, the answer, uh, but as I mentioned, um, through the RFG, we're also coordinating this higher education leadership initiative, right? And so we have 97 U.S. institutions that are involved there. We do have a particular working group that is um, that is looking at infrastructure and, and particularly shared infrastructure and how we might um, better integrate systems. And, and, and we understand it's not a one size fits all solution, but could we get kind of better integration and better flow? Um, and so there's a potential through, through those discussions to maybe talk about how we get better tracking at the institutional level and how that could potentially feed into um, funder reporting. And again, just to hammer that point home is just, that's why we, we think it's so important to have the community with representation from funders, from institutions, from infrastructure, so that we get all these groups that have been kind of historically working in silos to, to talk to one another and see, okay, if you do this piece and I do this piece, then this will make this whole thing easier, right? Um, so that's what we're trying to do. And if if that's a US institution that this person is, is at, they can reach out to me and I can give them more information on Helios. And then just quickly from ORCID, um, you know, your organization is certainly welcome to join ORCID. So if, if your organization is a separate legal entity from your home institution, then we'll need um, your organization to get membership from ORCID. Or maybe if you're, you know, aligned, uh, you're not a separate legal entity from your home organization. There's a good chance your home organization is already an ORCID member. Um, but, you know, you can ping me. I, I'll share my email address uh, and I can check for you. Um, so quickly, uh, you can join an ORCID consortium. And when your organization joins an ORCID consortium, we provide what's called an affiliation tool. And it's just really a quick spreadsheet where you can add the data about your organization and the roles that person has, and we can populate their employment or their education, their ORCID record for you. And when you do that, there's a green check mark that goes beside your organization's name, and that we call that trusted data. And I didn't get into the trust markers in this organ in this talk, but that's a whole other thing about validated, trustworthy data. So with that tool, that you can do that, and it's really easy and a support staff member could do that. So um, I'll add my email in and uh, we can have a chat. Great. So I think I'd like to move to some of the broader questions for all the panelists. I know there's still some open questions in the Q&A. So all panelists and also my colleagues feel free to um, answer those in the Q&A. So people still have the information. Um, but for now, I'd like to ask all panelists, what do you think needs to happen for open and fair output sharing to become the standard? Obviously, that's really what we all want to know <laughs> today. Um, I don't know, maybe Kristen, do you want to kick it off? Sure. Um, I always lean on this um, and I'm going to lean on it again, but it's the Center for Open Science's uh, strategy for behavior change um, kind of pyramid. Um, and I think that I think we're I think we're like we've just talked about a lot of ways that we're we're doing this currently, but it's it's the it, we need to get all levels of doctors on board. We kind of need to make a lot of things happen. One is make it possible. The infrastructure needs to exist. I think we're we I mean we're all here talking or everyone here is talking about that. So I think we've got a, this one kind of um, at the point where it is starting to happen um but we also need to make it easy um which means focusing on user interface and user experience um and and like one thing i i think twcf um is probably an early adopter for grant doi's which means it super, it wasn't super easy <laughs> two years ago to get uh, to do grant doi's and crossref has been working really hard to make it easier for us to to create grant doi's and so i think that is an example of um where the kind of community needs to continue heading um again we need to make it normative 
um, to make the fair output sharing uh, practices. We need to make the behaviors visible um, so that other people can see other people doing it. And so they think it's normal and that they should be doing it as well. So if more funders are doing the grant GOIs, other funders are like, hmm, this is supposed to be standard. And so other funders will get, um, will start doing it. I think uh, Maria kind of focus on that quite a bit and uh, a part of your um, talk as well. It's like a big part of us doing it is to see so other funders can look to look look at to see what we're doing and do the same thing. Um, it finally needs to be rewarding. Um, if we could like, for example, the if I we currently TWCF currently asks our funder, I mean our grantees to put their ORCID ID into the system, but that's not really having any um, favorable impacts on what the, on them so they're kind of they're just they're they're doing it but if we could get to the point where we have an integrated orchid id it means that applying for our grant would be easier for them um and finally for those really stubborn uh <laughs> uh people um we have to make it required as well and needs to be part of uh policy um so that was kind of long, but I, that pyramid is just amazing. And I use it all the time for <laughs> these kind of things. Great. Yeah, no, we also definitely use the pyramid. Uh, Maria. I just wanted to say that actually, I mean, this is uh, anecdata, uh, uh, but uh, actually because we are going to register grant uh, DOIs uh, hopefully uh, soon, uh, one of the other funders in the Netherlands, uh, or uh, Zonenve, they fund medical um, health, uh, health, uh, medical research. They they are want to do it as well because we are doing it. So yeah, it, it can work um, that we influence each other, as you said, Kristen. And yeah, and I'm all for the that uh, we we say it is the Brian Nozick pyramid, but yeah, we, we rely on that as well a lot. It's hard, though, to do all of that, but it all has to happen. And I'd say also for us as fund, at least for us as a funder, one of the difficulties is how to integrate our our system, uh, interoperability between our grant management system and, and the infrastructures. We are behind. Uh, and, and it's changing, but I think that's also an issue for many funders, maybe even publishers, legacy systems, uh, difficulty with integrated, integrating with modern infrastructure, which shouldn't be the case, but it's actually the reality. Thanks, Maria. And um, Erin? Yeah, just uh, plus one uh, what was said, but um, specifically on the kind of rewarding end, I think a big piece is missing um, in terms of incentives at the level of promotion and tenure. Um, so, you know, a lot of the time we have funder policies or we have, you know, we have great infrastructure, we have these things set up, um, but there aren't the incentives and rewards during those promotion and tenure processes to actually say, okay, at the institutional level, we want you to share. We're going to value that. We're going to recognize it when we do evaluations. Um, and I think until we we get that piece, we're just we're missing a big a big chunk. And and so that part of making it rewarding and maybe even required, we need multiple actors in the system to do that. Um, and and on the institutional end, I just really would love to see that that reform piece um, in promotion and tenure that kind of matches up with some of the other policy uh, developments that we're seeing. Thanks. Yeah, I think that all makes sense. Um, Shirley? Yeah, so I also really want to step on the pedal on the reward, uh, rewarding uh, piece and not only just uh, make it rewarding to, to, to do the action of, uh, of, you know, building that metadata record and all that, but also in terms of research, which is what the researchers care about the research result. If you wanted to answer that question, if one day Nobel Prize is given to a piece of research that is supported by reuse data, um, and people would look into how that happened and uh, would come back to us and ask us, how do we make things available or how do we look for available resources out there and build on that momentum? So this is really like rewarding in terms of making it amazing research um, that will uh, motivate uh, adoption. 
if I can pick up what Jali was saying, if anyone is committed or connected to the Nobel Committee in some way, if we can get Nobel to adopt PIDs, you know, because we did notice this year and we did celebrate that most of the Nobel Prize winners had an ORCID record and their data and their record were fairly well populated, which really helps the public with trust and transparency in science. It's really exciting. Um, but gosh, it'd be even better if Nobel would write the award to the ORCID record. And then as Jali was saying, yes. Yeah all the work with the DOIs and the data sets to support it. It would just make that that Nobel Prize so much richer. So if anybody has that connection to Nobel, you connect us to them, it'd be great. Yeah, we don't usually think of the Nobel Committee as a funder, but they actually are, they, they give awards. <laughs> Love that. I think we should do something with this. I hope someone is taking notes. <laughs> Let's think about this more after the session. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, I have another question, um, which is maybe a bit more for the people representing the funding organizations. In terms of supporting projects that prioritize open data sharing and fair practices, are there specific funding mechanisms or strategies that have been effective to sort of encourage researchers and research organizations to implement fair practices and persistent identifiers? Do you already have experience with that? Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, it's more of like a softer example, I guess. Uh, but um, most recently, we've or recently we've kind of uh, ran an an initiative or request for proposals in a particular initiative, and we kind of ran it as an open and collaborative initiative. And so it's been really focusing on best practices and open science more than some of our other initiatives have. Um, and we had an onboarding kind of introduction. Um, meeting with with everybody with all the um awardees um and a big part of that of like the the material that we provided and also how we introduced the projects to each other um uh, the grant doi was made pretty uh, like central in it like that was used as the identifier and it's really they i mean and just the awardees like being able to kind of click on that link to the grant DOI and it takes them to a summary page on our website where they can see the summary of their of their project along with their name and their institution and hopefully an image that they they like um like I I think that that just kind of anchored um with them like they were looking for like one of them didn't have a grant DOI yet because it hadn't contracted yet and they were looking for that grant DOI because it was just it, it kind of normalized it and um made it uh a kind of like a good thing to have and to be able and they've been kind of using it also um when they uh, share their award on twitter or x or whatever it is um but yeah so i think that is a softer kind of um example of it um but I thought it was a good one. Nice. And I guess, Maria, you also have some experience with this at NWO. Uh, well, we're not registering grants yet. But no, uh, no, yeah. I, mean, I, I didn't mean the grant part, but sort of um, funding for open science projects and, and yeah. which mechanisms work to ensure that researchers actually put this into practice. Well, on one hand, I, I mentioned it in my slides, we have our uh, Open Science Fund, which is really a funding uh, scheme for projects uh, on open science. And it's it's it has been very successful. And, and we run it in 2000, 2021. We were completely uh, oversubscribed. We received 169 applications. And this year we are running it again and we, we were able to increase the budget quite significant, significantly. And again, we received around uh, this year the same amount of proposals. So there's a lot of interest. Um, and, and we have funded some really interest, interesting projects, some uh, really on a, a lot of them on fair and data and fair data developing tools, some for fair workflows. And, and I, I really, it's really, yeah, we're not there. <laughs> We're not there yet in terms of uh, 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 grant assessment or promotion, career promotion. But it's it's also great to be able to, uh, yeah, reward people financially. You have a good idea for an open science project. Here's some money and go and do something. And I, I really like that. 
that is different from a prize because a prize people first have to do it and then you get the prize here you know it, it it's it's more hopefully a bit more inclusive that um yeah here, here here's some money to do it um yeah so that that's that's been quite successful and then yeah it's through the grant requirements and, and but especially through providing support and guidance because uh, and that goes back to that the pyramid because if you just put a policy out there and require people to do things but then they don't have the infrastructure the support the time it's it's not going to work um and it's not perfect but we uh, have invested in uh, uh building capacity at the research institutions in terms of uh data stewardship so all the universities now they i'm sure they could uh, have more but all the universities in the netherlands have data stewards that support researchers in complying with well with the funder policies but also institutional policies um so but yeah that that way we we are uh so yeah we are um enabling uh fair um but it's not perfect obviously thanks and Aaron yeah so I just want to say you know I, I mentioned kind of the policy piece for our members but another way that a lot of our members are supporting open scholarship efforts is precisely funding a lot of these efforts within the ecosystem. Um, so some of them have special portfolios in open science. Um, some of them have some of that embedded into different portfolios, different programs. Um, for example, CZI has a whole program focused on supporting open source software. So that's been fantastic. Um, I'll mention one kind of brand new mechanism that we have through the RFG, and that's that we recently launched uh, a small seed award program um, so this is to support open scholarship efforts, particularly at minority serving institutions, um, both in the US, but also in low and middle income countries. Um, and these are not big grants, they're, they're only up to 5,000 um, US dollars, but the idea is to kind of stimulate um, initiatives that are happening in, uh, in institutions that may have received less support or have less kind of infrastructure for these types of efforts. And um, one, of the, one of the kind of categories is capacity, another one is infrastructure. Um, this first funding round, we received 58 applications from I think it was 20 something different countries. So that was fantastic. And, and hopefully we'll have, um, yes, thanks Kristen for sharing that. Um, so Kristen, um, TWCF, one of, the, one of the funders supporting us uh, there. Um, and then we'll be opening up a second round as well. So really excited to see like if if we can stimulate some um, broader international efforts uh, through that mechanism. Thanks. Um, I don't want to forget about the questions that you wanted to ask each other. So let me go to Amanda's question. What effect will the merger of the Open Funder Registry and ROAR have on you? Has someone already thought about that? And Amanda, you, if you want to comment, then please feel free. I mean, I will, I will mention that um, I think some funders are not um, necessarily familiar with the Open Funder Registry. Um, so if that's the case, there's there's no shame in that. And of course, it's quite different from registering a an identifier for your grant. Um, many of you funders probably do already have identifiers in both systems. And there's it's I would think it's quite different from ORCID in that for ORCID, individual researchers are responsible for their own records. Um, they have control over those. With ROAR, it's a bit more like a map. You know, you don't have to do anything to get your house on a map. Someone has just created that map. So um, both of those registries are kind of independently curated. You certainly can um, update the the information in them, but you don't have to do that in order for that information to be there. Um, so yeah, I just am curious as to whether um, specifically for funders, um, is there anything about this this transition that that will affect you? I guess I'll push the question back to you. <laughs> we have a funder ID. Uh, not, I don't know if we have, I don't think we have a ROAR. Um, I think you do. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll check, but I think you do, yes. So we're, we're asking our grantees to use our funder ID. So what impact is that gonna have on us? <laughs> if we're, if like we have to change that? Right. Um, um, so eventually, yes, um, I can send you 
many blog posts, many announcements, but I can also just explain here. So the timeline uh, for um, the sunsetting, the deprecation of the open funder registry is a fair ways out. So it's not going to happen until after 2024 at the earliest, so say early 2025. And even then, for some of the specific use cases of funder IDs, which is such as in grant records or in Crossref metadata, Crossref in particular um, will be doing its own matching of those funder IDs to war IDs. Um, now, once the funder registry ceases to add new records, ceases to update new records, I mean, that data will get stale. So eventually you will want to, to switch to war, but there's no urgency about it. It's just something that you need to be thinking about. And I, as I say, I think the, the um, one of the real benefits of this is only needing to use one registry, only needed to one, use, one, one set of persistent identifiers for multiple purposes, right? Rather than having to use ROAR for investigator affiliations and the funder registry for identifying yourself, right? That sort of thing. You can use ROAR for both of those. Um, so, um, so yes, eventually, if you've got if you've got funder IDs built into your workflows and your systems, you're fine for now, you're fine for the next year, you're probably fine beyond that, but you should know about this now and begin thinking about eventually trying to switch over to Roar for that. I think, Jin, you had your hand up at some point. I don't know if you want to comment as well or if Amanda said it all. Amanda said, said it all, <laughs> just to say that the overlap between the funder registry and the Roar registry is really high. So if there is a funder uh, ID, an open funder registry ID, it's very likely to have a Roar ID or will. And we're already passing through requests for changes in the funder registry through to the Roar curation team. And what's um, what Amanda said about that, yeah, there's now one registry. It's also openly curated, whereas the funder registry has been around for 10 years, but you couldn't see those requests or changes coming in from funders or publishers or others. So this is, you know, RAW is a much more um, community-led and transparent um, way. So yes, there'll be a transition period and it will be painful for publishers, especially, I would say, because it's very embedded there. Um, for any publishers on the line. <laughs> publishers on the line, yes. You have time uh, to plan this, but it, it will be, it's like, you know, ripping off a plaster or something it sort of has to be done <laughs> but uh we'll help wherever we can with mapping and uh matching and we did um thank you jenny for posting our brand new shiny newly released blog post from this morning um that goes into um quite a bit of detail about how how much overlap there is between the open funder registry and roar so for those of you who are not watching the chat TWCF does have a Roar ID, <laughs> um, so hooray! You know that's that's done. And you're and as I said, it's it's going to be easier for you to edit that as well. So if you look at that record and say, oh, that's wrong or that needs to be augmented, you know, there's just a little link you can click and request that. Whereas with the Open Funder Registry, as as terrific as it is and has been, a bit more difficult to kind of get that um, that metadata updated. Nice. So the panel already started to talk a bit uh, about incentives when talking about the Center for Open Science pyramid. And I think that's what the next question relates to. Um, how do you think the impact and effect effectiveness of open sharing and fair practices can be measured and rewarded? Who wants to start with this? Obviously not, there's no easy answer, but I'm sure people have some thoughts. I see Shelly unmuting. Yeah. So I just want to say, isn't that a million dollar question? Um, but I, instead of answering it, I'm going to further complicate it uh, about the, 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 <laughs> the impact is uh, we're talking about here uh, in the in the grant of, uh, context and the grant cycles are limited but impact of research is unlimited. It's a have a long tail and uh, it doesn't stop at the end of the project cycle. So um, how do we get uh, add that into the equation as well? And uh, I think, yeah, any funder side <laughs> can comment. Aaron. 
Yeah, I'll dive in. Um, it, it's it's a hard it's a hard question. So I don't know that any of us are going to have the perfect answer. I think, as you said, we've already talked about some of it. So um, you you reward it through uh, through policy, through granting mechanisms, through hopefully um, promotion and tenure uh, criteria. Um, the idea being that if you can get all those different actors that a that a researcher might be listening to or um, responding to, uh, to kind of be saying the same thing and rewarding the same things, then that would be, that would be ideal. Um, uh, and I was gonna say just on the measuring, I think that's, that's a huge challenge. It's something that I think a lot of our funders are, are, um, are thinking a lot about, but I don't know that there's any one solution. Um, I'll say one thing we're trying to embed into this seed award program is a measurement evaluation and learning component. So um, we're working with folks that are experts in this area um, that are hopefully gonna help us measure, you know, what what happens with those grants? What is what is their actual impact at their institutional level or or more broadly? Um, how exactly we're gonna do that, I think is gonna depend a lot on what the different projects are kind of um, intending to do at a capacity level or infrastructure level or, or so on. Um, but we are definitely thinking about embedding, explicitly embedding those um, measurement evaluation learning strategies into these um, funding programs. And I think other funders are, are thinking about the same thing. Um, I'll add, uh, I mentioned earlier, the uh, open and collaborative initiative that we, um, have, which is actually listening and learning in a polarized world. Um, we're working with i -Corps, um, incentivizing open, I don't know the other, words. <laughs> sorry, um, I'll put the link in there, but they are, we're working with them so that they can try to measure the impact of the changes that we've made in this particular funding initiative on um, uh, the, the increased sharing and collaboration. Um, so that's we. I mean, like Aaron says, we. This is something that we're. This is taking. This does take a lot of effort and a lot of um, energy on our part um, in terms of trying to implement some of these things and getting our our researchers to also do the same and other infrastructure providers. But there's not a whole lot of um, very concrete data that that it's. Um, that it makes a big difference. Um, so um, that's that's a big part, um, which we, I, I think, I mean, we're all doing it because we know, we feel like it does, but it'd be great to have some um, evidence with it as well. Thanks. Uh, Maria first, I think, and then Shona. Yeah, I was just thinking, I, I was a researcher once upon a time and this brings me, you know, more research, I, I'm just thinking more research is needed. And, but in particular, from a funder perspective, we probably also need to invest in research, in the, in, in open research, uh, re, uh, meta research and, and, and fund actual research on, on this topic. I was recently at a, a meeting in Leiden in, here in the Netherlands on, yeah, actually with scholars from this field and research assessment. Yeah, and, and I think we need just to fund more of that work and try to understand because, you know, just look, and we do this as a funder. I, I, I was just reviewing a, a doc, you know, we have an OA uh, open access monitor, but then what does it mean? You know, we reached 90% open access of all our publications, but then in terms of values, what what does that mean? Uh, maybe you will, you know, as if we, we, we have a policy that research needs uh, research data needs to be as open as possible as close as necessary maybe we'll monitor it we don't right now and then we have lots of open data but does that lead to better research or uh, more reproducible research we don't know actually there's not a lot of um th there isn't a, a very a large evidence base for some of, of these claims so i think we need also to fund these type of studies yeah that makes a lot of sense Ashona. Just to contribute to what everybody else is saying, because uh, I fully support it, uh, ORCID, we're about to launch a new feature in an ORCID record. So at the top of a record, a researcher can activate a summary of the what's been added to your ORCID records. So how many works have been added, how many funds, employment data. And so hopefully that summary can help 
you know, incentivize uh, researchers to approve data to be written to their ORCID record. And then when somebody goes to assess their impact or just to help them, hopefully that new feature of ours will really help with the overall incentives. Great. Okay, so I want to move to the final question. Um, before I do that, I think there are also still a couple of comments and questions in the Q&A, uh, also some for specific panelists. So maybe uh, all of you can take a quick look to see if there's anything you need to answer there so that all the attendees go home with all the answers they were looking for. Um, yeah, and then the final question for the panel. So I think Shaoli, at the end of her talk, uh, was asking some questions around uh, providing advice to others that are doing this. And so that is pretty much what I want to ask all the panelists, sort of as some final words in this session from all of you. Um, what would your advice be for other people in this space working on this? What is really important to consider um, so what would you like the audience to know and the other panelists to know before we wrap up? And I think we'll go in the same order in uh, in which we did the talk. So uh, yeah, Ginny, sorry, you don't get a lot of time to think about this. <laughs> Your advice, please. <laughs> uh, can you remind me of the question? <laughs> advice for um, people getting involved in? Yeah, yeah, people working in this space. I mean, I realize we have different stakeholder groups on the, on the, on the call, so whatever you think is very important as a take home message for everyone attending this session today. I think I would reference back to something Kristen said earlier, which is like, everybody has to play their part <laughs> in order for this to work. Um, and also what Maria said, it's like, you know, we can, uh, we can contribute what we know, what we're the authority on. Um, and, you know, Crossref Data Site and ORCID, we're sort of like spinning in the middle in all directions, actually, hoping to, and there's lots of activities to advise, to write guides, FAQs. Um, and that maybe a slightly less positive thing is like, we're often asked about, about what are the benefits of this for me? And it's hard to answer when you're not the funder or the publisher. And, um, I think it's I think it's on every every stakeholder in this space to answer that question for themselves a little bit because you know, I think everyone in this group is a, is a non-profit we're not selling services here we're not you know we're not trying to pitch a deal or anything so like if a if a publisher's you know it's like why should I why should I collect grant IDs you know I would turn that back and say why are you curating a record about research what do you hope to get out of that? What what impact do you want to have down the road? And Crossref, Data Site, and Orchid, and other systems, of course, are you know partners to help you with that. But it's really for you to to figure out the benefits. That's no, I love that. That yeah, that is a great point. Thank you, um, Charlie. Yeah, I just want to follow up to that. Yes, for different stakeholders, they uh, they figure out their own benefit. But overall, all of us are working towards a better environment but uh, for for research for science and that is sometimes we lose sight of and we, we think of all the things like researchers and all, uh, all the groups need to do to contribute to all these things and eventually it will become a harmonized uh, you know transparent world and that alleviate all the burdens but at this stage we still have a lot of work that I have to put into it and at the, at the first glance researchers will say oh that's too much work to, for me and why am I doing this but uh, but with even with that we should never lose sight of what the vision is and um, uh, and everyone should get their voice heard and also should be very carefully listening to each other so that um, the community can work together. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, Shauna. You know, for all the funders on the call today and, you know, uh, organizations that hire uh, researchers, um, please know that this is early days for everybody. And, you know, if you're interested in getting involved with PIDs, you know, get in touch with us because everybody's at a different stage. And, and as their PID providers, we work with everyone. So don't be shy. Get in touch with us. We'll have a conversation. We'll talk, you know, understand where you are on your path for PID adoption. And we'll meet you where you are and we'll help you along. Um, and then for any of the vendors that may be on the call, um, please integrate with us. You can hear... <laughs> 
you know, there's just make this easier for researchers, make it easier for funders, make it easier for everybody that we want the data to flow. We want machines to talk to each other and it'll just make everybody's life so much easier. So vendors, please get in touch with us and integrate. Um, gosh, we're all ready for it. Please integrate is also great advice. Um, Amanda. Advice um, for especially funders who are listening on the call, check your ROAR record personally, um, submit us any corrections, any additions that you like. We want to get that from you. Um, if we approve it, it should go live within a month. We want that activity from you. Um, I suppose I also want to say, and I've spoken to a couple of you in the chat, specifically for Roar and I think also for ORCID, um, it, it is so true that these things become more valuable the more systems that adopt them. So it really is up to vendors, to platform developers, to system developers to integrate these PIDs so that um, people at organizations can use those systems to make all kinds of tracking and reporting uh, more easy. So for a couple of you who are specifically at research centers, um, I, I would really love to learn what people are currently doing to track their reporting. Kristen, you talked a lot about your systems. I mean, I think you've um, set up some amazing tracking systems. But this is something that I've become very, very curious about is how how are people currently tracking their impact, tracking their awardees research outputs. So um, the other request slash advice I have for you is please get in touch with me at Amanda at war.org and tell me what you currently are doing, because I think that will help inform my own personal and Roar's um, understanding of how to get you and us closer to that ideal vision of here is an easy way for you to track that that is also openly available freely available to the public and to other researchers and to the entire research ecosystem which is my ideal vision great so amanda will put her email address in the chat for <laughs> anyone who wants to reach out and share more information I think Aaron was next. Yeah, thanks. Um, so many good points, and I'm, I'm hoping that I can follow up on all of them. Um, I think what Amanda just said in terms of what are you doing, I think my advice would be to talk to one another. Um, I think a, a lot of the time, again, we kind of remain in our in our bubbles. And I think one of the things we've seen from the community effort is that getting different actors across the ecosystem in a space where they can share with one another what they're doing, um, that's that's been really effective, I think. And, and so just continuing to talk to one another and sharing lessons learned. Um, the other thing is it, um, several folks mentioned, you know, everybody playing their part and just to kind of harp again on this idea that like we really do need all these different actors in the space doing things to make this work. Um, I'm gonna borrow from, from Greg Tannenbaum, who's our, our director at ORFG. He, he always talks about these mutually reinforcing vectors, right? Can we get everybody rowing in the same direction? Um, that's really what we need to, to make this happen. Um, and again, to get those mutually reinforcing vectors, we really need people talking to one another um, to make sure that there's that alignment. Um, and then the last piece I'll, I'll mention is just to make sure that as we're developing policies, as we're developing strategies, we're keeping kind of equitable outcomes in mind um, that we're not, I think some people mentioned in the chat and the questions, you know, that we're not at, unintentionally increasing burden for researchers or, or particularly researchers in um, underfunded institutions and, and, and environments, um, kind of keeping that equitable lens on things. Um, and just uh, on that, I just want to make a quick plug so that um, the, the roundtable that we coordinate through the National Academies is going to be running a workshop, uh, particularly on kind of developing approaches to equitable and inclusive implementation of open scholarship policies. So that'll be next week on October 19th. I'll put a link in the chat because you can register to virtually attend that. So hopefully we're gonna hear, we're gonna hear from some great speakers that are gonna help us keep that kind of equity lens on things and talk about potential unintended outcomes. Great point. Um, Kristen. I think what I'm saying is a little bit of repetitive what others have said, but um, I just, biggest advice is just to talk to a peer who has 
done this before. I mean, the only the reason why I was able to do grant you documentation on on Crossref is great, but I reached out to someone else who was already doing it, um, and actually got like his his forms and his files so that I can just replicate what he was doing so that I can just put it into into Crossref that way, um, and. And um, he was very happy that I reached out to him and I would be very happy if another funder reached out to me. I mean, it's something that we're excited to share. Um, and so if you see a pair who's doing it and you want to know if you want to do it yourself and just just talk to them, I think. Great. OK, then Maria. Oh, this is really hard, everybody. <laughs> Everything, but I'll, I think I, I'll probably summarize what people have been saying. But it's also my experience of trying to integrate persistent, you know, trying to implement our persistent identifier strategy. And I, I'd say, be patient, be persistent as well. You know, keep going even when it's it feels hard and slow. Be collaborative, indeed. Talk uh, to as many people uh, as you can, and and and. I'm been very fortunate, you know, to have been in conversations well with Ginny, with Shauna, with Erin, um, and uh, and Helen, Helena, and Yoli. So, yeah, talk to one another, uh, be collaborative, and lead by example where you can do your part. Uh, a lot of actors are needed, but we, uh, I really liked what you said, Erin, about trying to row in the same direction and we all have to just do our part we might actually it's like a boat isn't it we can't do it alone but if we all do our part we pull our weight we'll get somewhere very true well thanks for rowing in this boat with me today i thought you were a great panel really enjoyed the discussion thanks also to all the attendees for your questions and suggestions. Uh, there will be a couple of more sessions as part of the Datasite community meeting today. I think Paul already put a link in the chat for those to, uh, who want to register for other sessions. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, there will be um, a brief survey when you leave this meeting. And yeah, thanks again. Thanks to all of you. And uh, yeah, let's continue to row together. <laughs>